name. Amen. All right, we are going to get back into this study in um, in Second Samuel, and you will recall that last week we all but finished our previous handout. I didn't hand that back out again this morning because we just have some very brief points to make. At the end of each of these handouts, <clears throat> when we reach that point, I try to make some lesson applications about things we've studied, people we've studied, events we've uncovered, and uh, then we'll move on to the next one. So in summing up things from the previous handout, in uh, chapter 15 and the front end of chapter 16, a lesson we can think about from Absalom, David's son. We call him a wayward son. He was rebelling against his father. And it's remarkable how deceitful he was and how comfortable he became in that deceitful practice. He was covering up so many things. He was planning his brother's death. He was planning to overthrow his father. He was deceitful in that. He was being like a deceitful politician in the way he went around and uh, promoted himself to other people. He was a real charmer. And as people would bring complaints and problems to his father, he would head them off at the pass at the gate of the city. And there was never a complainer that he didn't agree with. Oh, if I was just in charge, I'd be on your side and help you out. And uh, he really knew how to uh, play that up big, but he was deceitful all the way through that, and he got rather comfortable in it. A second lesson would be gained from Ittai the Gittite. He's the one who had recently come to David. David said, you came to me just yesterday, meaning you've only been here a very short time, and David is now going to be fleeing Jerusalem. He's on the run for his life from his own son Absalom, and Ittai is determined to go with David. And David said, no, you don't need to do that. You just got here, and I don't expect this from you. But Ittai was going to go with David regardless, and uh, he teaches a good lesson about discipleship and about what it means to be committed to our Lord. So Ittai was very loyal, very faithful, even though he had just arrived. A third lesson would be from Zadok and Abiathar, the priest, and then Hushai, who was a counselor and friend of David. Uh, they also practiced a certain amount of deceitfulness as they went back to Jerusalem to be by the side of Absalom, feigning loyalty to him. But we learn about them that they wanted to go with David in the beginning. They would rather be with David out in the wilderness on the run than to be in Jerusalem where it was more comfortable. But David called them to go back to Jerusalem to hang around the city and around Absalom and get news and information and pass it on to David. And one of the things that I think we can learn from this is that we may all have preferences about how we want to serve. But sometimes our greatest service is in doing what is needed, not necessarily what we would prefer to do. And so they were willing to go back to Jerusalem and serve in ways they had rather not do, but it was beneficial to do that. So think about how you serve. You may have preferences, and I may have preferences, but there may be needs that we can fill that are outside of our preference, but are really needful and would serve a great purpose. Ziba is another lesson we can glean from this. He was originally a servant in the household of Saul. And then Saul and his sons died in battle at Mount Gilboa, and they fought the Philistines, and Eventually, he was passed on as a servant to Saul's grandson, son of Jonathan, Mephibosheth, who was lame in both feet. And he was going to become his servant. And we find Ziba in our previous lesson advancing himself. He was greedy. He was lying. He was slandering his master, Mephibosheth. And, uh, and so he ends up gaining a lot of property that had belonged to, to Mephibosheth. First all of it, and finally half of it. 
And we don't know the end of Ziba. We're not told about how all that played out in his life, but we should not imagine that he gets away free with that. He was telling a lie against Mephibosheth. And certainly as our God is a God of justice, that would catch up to him whether in this life or in the next. But we shouldn't imagine that he got away with that. His evil ways certainly would not win. Our final lesson in our previous handout is from Shimei. And um, Curtis, you brought up last week about the New International Version where he was throwing um, dirt on David. And that was in um, chapter 16 and verse 13, I believe. And if you back up to verse 6, the, the NIV has that he pelted them with stones. And pelted would carry the idea that he was hitting them. He's pelting them with stones and he is showering them with dirt. But as I looked at all the other translations that I could put my hands on, none of the others seemed to read that way. And so it seems that the NIV took a little privilege with that. It, it doesn't make sense that he's actually showering David and his companions with dirt. How far can you throw dirt? Go home and try that today. Well, try not to get mud. Mud will go further. Try to wait until you can find dust and see how far you can just throw dust or dirt. You can't throw it very far, which would indicate he'd have to be pretty much next to them. And that's not the way the text reads. He's on a hillside parallel to them, and uh, it, it doesn't seem that that's actually the way it reads. Everything else that I could find said he threw it at them, in their direction. Uh, but if they were actually hitting the king with rocks, if, they, if he was actually that close, I don't imagine he would have survived. Uh, so I think NIV is a little unusual there and takes a little privilege in the way that it words that. Uh, anything else? Kind of like up over his head. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that's really the indication there that he's on a cliff. That would be more of a cliff, and it reads more that he's on a hillside. So you have to picture the hillsides around Jerusalem as you're exiting to, uh, to the east and uh, out of the city, that there wouldn't be cliffs in that area. And so uh, I think, again, NIV takes a little privilege there. So Shimei is making assumptions about David, and he also makes assumptions about God's will toward David, that God is punishing David that God is punishing him for somehow uh, the death of family members in Saul's clan, and that God's actually on Absalom's side with this and punishing David, and he's being cast out and, and things of that sort, and it all goes back to what happened to King Saul. Well, that's not the case. He's reading too much. He's reading his own will into that and making assumptions about God's will and about David. And after a while, we're going to find out Shimei has to eat his words when David comes back to Jerusalem. So remember that Jesus warned us about um, our words in Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 through 37. We need to be very careful about our words. By our words will be justified, by our words will be condemned, and we need to choose our words very carefully. And, uh, and we can't make assumptions about things. And, uh, and so that's a good lesson for us to think about. Don't let the emotion of the moment uh, take you away from the logic of God's Word. All right, that's the end of our previous lesson, and I told you it wouldn't take too long to get through that. Any final comments before we turn the page here to our new handout? All right, you should have that in hand now. And if you happen to come in and don't have a copy of that, would you raise a hand? We'll get one to you. Everybody's got one. Uh, that's fine. We'll pick it up later. Thank you. All right, we are, uh, we are looking at Absalom's two counselors now. And uh, anybody remember what their names are, his two counselors? who are going to be contrary to one another. Ahithophel and Hushai. 
Those are the two counselors. They're in the title of this lesson, Absalom's two counselors. David has fled Jerusalem. Absalom is threatening him. In chapter 15, verse 28, David said, See, I'm going to wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. And David has his information network set up. And here's the way it is. This is, this is the fullness of that network as we can understand it in Scripture. Hushai, the counselor to Absalom now, is going to be right next to the king and hear information that nobody else is going to be privy to. So Hushai is the counselor to Absalom. When he gets information that's important to David, he's going to go and tell it to the two priests, Zadok and Abiathar. Zadok and Abiathar are going to inform a maidservant. And the maidservant is going to go outside of the city to the sons of those two priests. They each have a son, and they are Ahimeaz and Jonathan. And the maidservant's going to go tell the two sons of the two priests the information. Then the two sons are going to go find David by the fords of the Jordan and tell him the news. That's the way the information is getting passed along. 2 Samuel 17, verse 17. Now Jonathan and Ahimeaz were staying at Enrogel, and a maidservant would go and tell them, and they would go and tell King David, for they could not be seen entering the city. So they are somewhere southeast of the city, heading to the east somewhere. They're outside the city, and Enrogel, as I recall on the map, is going to be southeast of Jerusalem. And, uh, and they're waiting there for their information. Then they go find David by the Jordan River. So David and his group, his company, they're waiting at the west bank of the Jordan River. They're trying to figure out what is Absalom's next move, and then what should our maneuvering be to avoid that. In this lesson, Absalom is going to enter Jerusalem. Here he comes into the city now. His father's gone, and he's going to assert his authority as the new king, and he's going to listen to his two counselors. They both have tactical movements and information, and, um, and the first is going to be Ahithophel, and then he's going to call Hushai in to see what he has to say, and he wants to kill his father. And he wants the counselors to tell him the best way to do that. Ahithophel was a defector. He had been David's counselor. He was also the grandfather of Bathsheba. So he may have a little bone to pick with David, and he switches sides to Absalom. Hushai is still loyal to David, and he is a spy in Absalom's court, and his effort According to David's prayer in 2 Samuel 15, verse 31, David prayed for the Lord to thwart the counsel of Ahithophel. And Hushai shows up as the answer to that prayer, and that's why he's back in Jerusalem. So we're going to be looking for lesson applications as we move through the text and uh, unfold this history. Our outline is going to be like this. We're picking up in 2 Samuel 16, verse 15. And we have the arrival of Hushai. That's verses 16 through 19. Then Ahithophel gives his first counsel, verses 20 through 23. Then we're into chapter 17, and Ahithophel is going to give his second counsel on another matter in chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. Then Hushai gives conflicting counsel to that of Ahithophel, in chapter 17, verses 5 through 14. Hushai sends warning to David, verses 15 through 22. And finally, we have the death of Ahithophel in verse 23. Let's read verse 15 through 19, please. Then Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, entered Jerusalem, and Ahithophel with him. Now it came about when Hushai the archite, David's friend, came to Absalom, that Hushai said to Absalom, Long live the king! Long live the king! Absalom said to Hushai, Is this your loyalty to your friend? 
Why did you not go with your friend? Then Hushai said to Absalom, No, for whom the Lord, this people, and all the men of Israel have chosen, his I will be, and with him I will remain. Besides, whom should I serve? Should I not serve in the presence of his son, as I have served in your father's presence? So I will be in your presence. So Absalom, verse 15, comes into the city. He has the support of the people and uh, all the men of Israel. And he has, at the end of verse 15, Ahithophel in tow. And that is a very powerful statement. Given the information about Ahithophel, to consult him is like consulting God himself. Ahithophel, Ahithophel was that accurate of a counselor. And so to have Ahithophel with him as he enters the city makes a powerful statement to everybody who sees that. Hushai's arrival and, uh, and his uh, answers to the king are in verses 16 through 19 then. And uh, so he shows up and, uh, and when he shouts out, verse 16, long live the king, long live the king. Who does he mean? He means David. How does Absalom take it? Well, he's talking about me. So when Hushai shows up with this double announcement, long live the king, in Hushai's mind, he's thinking David. But in Absalom's mind, in his pride and ego, he's thinking, okay, he's talking about me. Long live me. Long live me. And so there's some deceptive answers that are there. And, uh, and Absalom understands that Hushai's been very close to David in verse 17. And he, said, he refers to his father as Hushai's friend. Is this loyalty to your friend? Is this what it looks like? And uh, so he wants to know why the change. Now why are you here with me? Why would you make that change? Because you are my father's friend. So what's going on here? And Hushai has to convince him. And so verse 18, Hushai gives another deceptive answer. A veiled statement. No, for whom the Lord, this people, and all the men of Israel have chosen, his I will be. All right, there's two ways to take that. How does Absalom take it? He's for me. What does Hushai mean? Has the Lord chosen Absalom? You look at the Lord, if you go back in time to uh, Saul, King Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 24. Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? And then the people shouted and said, Long live the king. That's when Saul was made king. Do you see whom the Lord has chosen? And they shouted, Long live the king. Then you get to 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. Previously, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and in. And the Lord said to you, now they're talking about David. The Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel. You will be a ruler over my people. And that's where they anointed David king over, uh, over Israel and Hebron. The Lord chose Saul. The Lord chose David. The Lord did not choose Absalom. Absalom chose himself. So when Hushai announces that, um, well, whoever the Lord's chosen and the people and the men, well, the Lord never chose Absalom. He chose David. And so Hushai's statements here are veiled. They're deceptive. They have two meanings. And Absalom takes it the way that he wants to, and Hushai, in his heart and mind, knows that he's talking about David. I found that to be a similar case when talking to people about Bible things today. We need to be very careful with that. Because sometimes people say things, and we have a preconceived notion about it, that I'm using these Bible words this way. And so I'm going to speak words the way I understand them in the Bible. 
and somebody else may look at me and nod their head in agreement. But they're hearing something very differently than what I'm saying because they're using words differently. And we need to be very careful that as we talk about Bible things that what we're saying is what's being heard and that the message is clear. One of the things that you'll hear me say probably fairly frequently I'll talk about the Church of Christ. And I realize that there are some who visit with us and don't understand that. They think I'm talking about the Church of Christ the way others would talk about denominationalism. That's not at all what I mean. When I talk about the Church of Christ, I'm talking about the Church that belongs to Christ. It's the church of Christ. Like the car of Cole or the house of Kirk. I'm talking about possession. The Lord has possession of His church. He is the head of His church. It is the church that is defined in New Testament pages. It has all of those marks. It belongs to our Lord. It's the church of Christ. That's what I mean by that. But a lot of people hear that as though, oh, it's just another title like Presbyterian Church, Methodist Church, Baptist Church, Catholic Church. That's not at all the way I'm using that terminology. Somebody else may use, and I had a phone call this week, and this is so easy for me. I'm in my office, and, and, and the phone rings, and I'm the only one there, and I pick it up, and Wassel Church of Christ, Dan speaking, and some nice lady said she'd like to talk to a pastor. Is there a pastor there? And I said, no, there's not. Sorry. Okay, well, would you tell them I called? I'll, I'll tell them you called. Because pastor is another word for shepherd. Pastor is the Latin term for shepherd. And it's used one time in most Bibles in Ephesians 4 and verse 11 referring to the elders in a congregation. The elders, the shepherds. But one time in most Bibles, they lean toward the Latin word pastor rather than shepherd. Every other place, it's shepherd in the Bible. But in, in this place, in this one location, it's usually pastor. And most people assign the term pastor to the local preacher. Well, I'm not a pastor because I'm not an elder. I'm not one of the shepherds here. I'm a preacher but I'm not a pastor. So she asked me, is there a pastor there I can talk to? And I said, no. I know we're using the words differently. She's meaning one thing and I'm meaning something else, but it got me out of a phone call. And so now I, 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 I can see, you know, here's, here's an elder over here. She called and I got a note in my office if you'd like to follow up on it, <laughs> but, but probably not, just a sales call. People use words differently. When we talk to them about things, it's like this conversation between Hushai and Absalom. One saying one thing, one's hearing something else. And so you want to be sure the message is heard and clear. All right. That's uh, Hushai's uh, showing up there at Jerusalem. And, uh, and 2 Samuel 16, verse 19, Besides whom should I serve? Should I not serve in the presence of his son? Listen to this. As I have served in your father's presence. Well, how did he serve in David's presence? That's the way he's going to serve in Absalom's presence. What's Absalom here? Oh, he's going to serve me the way he served my father, meaning he's going to be loyal to me, be my friend. That's not what Hushai means. As I served in your father's presence, that's how I'm going to serve in your presence. I'm still serving your father in your presence. That's what Hushai means. That's his loyalty. So you have about three different veiled statements going on here that can be taken two ways, and Absalom takes it the way that he wants to. Do you have any final comments there? We're going to move forward if not. Okay.
so I will serve you. So, it, it, again, the NIV, NIV is a thought-for-thought thought translation. Uh, and it, it's good to be familiar with our Bible translations. Uh, some are word-for-word. Word. They're a little choppier and harder for our English ears sometimes. They're word-for-word. Word. And some are more of a thought-for-thought thought translation where they don't translate each word-for-word, word, but they might put a phrase in for a word that they think gives the the meaning the word's intending. And NIV is a thought-for-thought thought translation, and so they take just a little privilege in there, and the translators tell you this is, this is how we think about it. And, um, and so still you can read in that the veiled answer that I'm going to serve you in your presence the way I've served your father. But what he means is, I'm still serving your Father in your presence, and I'm going to serve you as though I'm serving Him. That's really what he intends there, but he cloaks that. I mean, he's so careful with his choice of words that he can avoid that. Sort of like a politician, don't you think? Um, uh, if, you're, if someone ever says, oh, you'd make a good politician, they're not complimenting you. They're saying that you have veiled, cloaked answers and you're very careful with how you say things so no one can really pin you down too much. And uh, that's the way this conversation has gone on. Now we're to verses 20 through 23. Then Absalom said to Ahithophel, give your advice. So we've moved, uh, if you can in your mind, the curtain closes on the stage and it opens back up to another scene. Hushai's gone and Ahithophel is now before Absalom. Absalom said to Ahithophel, give your advice, what shall we do? He's just come into Jerusalem, he's asserting his authority as the new king. Ahithophel, what's the next move? And Ahithophel said to Absalom, go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house. Then all Israel will hear that you've made yourself odious to your father. The hands of all who are with you will also be strengthened. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof. And Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. The advice of Ahithophel, which he gave in those days, was as if one inquired of the word of God. So was all the advice of Ahithophel regarded by both David and Absalom. So Absalom says, give your advice. And it's interesting the word your, give your advice. Your is a plural. Almost as if Ahithophel is over a group of counselors, a board of counselors. Give your plural advice. Give, you know, or maybe, you know, that seems to be the sense that he's over a group here possibly. And, uh, and so Ahithophel begins to speak, and he talks about going into his father's concubines. A concubine is nothing more than a wife. Uh, there were wives who had social standing, maybe the daughter of a king from this place, or, or someone of high social standing, and it would have to do with making covenants, foreign alliances, that sort of thing. And then there were others who were of lower social standing, who didn't carry that kind of clout, and they were concubines. And so a concubine's a wife, and David has ten of them here, and he leaves them in Jerusalem to tend to the house, to take care of things when he flees Jerusalem. And you go all the way back to 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 8, and this goes uh, to the confrontation of Nathan with David. I also will give your master's house and your master's wives into your... I also gave your master's house and your master's wives into your care. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. That's the way one asserted ruling authority. David's coming in after Saul. And so he's being reminded that I gave you your master's wives. And so that's one of the things that would be done as a new ruler would come in and to assert his position as the new king is to take the other one's wives. 
It's a little different when it comes to Israel. They had some different laws in the law of Moses. We'll talk about that momentarily. But there's an interesting uh, dialogue between Adonijah, Bathsheba, and Solomon. It's going to come up later. Adonijah is another son of David's. And when Solomon's taking the throne, there's a conversation that comes up where Adonijah, his brother, wants to marry a woman by the name of, i got to say this right, Abishag. Abishag was a beautiful young virgin who they contacted late in the years of David. David was always cold at night, had trouble sleeping. And so they found Abishag. And they bring this beautiful young virgin to David to keep him warm. But David wouldn't consort with her. And now Adonijah, David's son, David's out of the picture, Solomon's on the throne, and Adonijah is requesting to marry Abishag. And uh, Solomon understands that the request of Adonijah is a move on the throne. And that's how he replies to his mother Bathsheba. Well, why don't you just ask for the throne for Adonijah? And he has Adonijah executed. Adonijah was making a move on the throne against Solomon. And Solomon in his wisdom saw through that request to marry Abishag and had his brother executed. Ahithophel counsels that all Israel will hear. How will they hear? We're going to do this on the rooftop. We're going to pitch a tent on the rooftop and everybody will see you going into my father's concubines up on the rooftop. This is like a billboard advertisement to everybody about what's going on inside the tent. And everybody will hear about this and they'll know now you have made yourself just odious to David. There's zero chance of, of reconciliation. It is over, and it's going to embolden everybody to move against David with you. They're going to understand that this is not a maybe thing. This is a done deal. This is the way it's going to be from now on. And so everybody's going to hear about this. This again goes back to Nathan and, and David. In 2 Samuel 12, verse 11, Nathan told David... I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I'll even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. And now that's happening. Now, when Absalom took his father's concubines on that rooftop, that violated Old Testament law. You do not do that. You don't uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. You don't do it. And that was forbidden in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 11. So he's violating Old Testament law. But they pitched the tent on the roof. Well, where did David see Bathsheba? From the rooftop. Where's Absalom lie with his father's concubines? On the rooftop. David, what you did in secret with Bathsheba, I'm going to do in broad daylight, and, and your enemy's going to come in, and he's going to do this on the rooftop in broad daylight. And that's exactly what's happening here. And you think about that and how awful sin is, how it returns in multiplied ways against us. Remember that text in Hosea chapter 8, verse 7, we sow the wind, we reap the whirlwind. Sin comes back in such a multiplied way you can't ever imagine how awful it's going to be. We think maybe this sin is in some kind of a capsule that I can control. And nobody else is going to find out about it and I'm going to limit the fallout from that because I've got it in this capsule. That's not the way sin works. It multiplies. And it comes back at us, and we can't imagine how awful that's going to be. 2 Samuel 16, verse 23, There was this high regard for the advice of Ahithophel, 
But in his support of Absalom, he's actually departed from the Word of God. His advice was like consulting the Word of God, but he recommends that Absalom lie with his father's concubines. That's against Old Testament law. So Ahithophel is diverted from his normal course, and now he's advising things that are in conflict with God. All right, that takes us through the end of that chapter. Now we're into chapter 17. We have just enough time to read a little bit there, maybe four verses, and begin some comments. Furthermore, Ahithophel said to Absalom, Please let me choose 12,000 men that I may arise and pursue David tonight. This is another council of Ahithophel now. Let me go with 12,000 men and we're going to pursue David right now, right tonight. And I'll come upon him while he's weary and exhausted and terrify him so that all the people who are with him will flee. Then I'll strike down the king alone and I'll bring back all the people to you. The return of everyone depends on the one man you seek. Then all the people will be at peace. So the plan pleased Absalom and all the elders of Israel. So Ahithophel sees an opportunity. This is like you're watching a movie. And there's some enemy, there's some nemesis. And he's been foiled, he's on the run, he's weakened, he's in trouble. And if that guy gets away, if they don't pursue him right now, if they don't track him down right now and he gets away, he's going to regroup and be a problem later. And in the movie, you always want them to get him, get him, get him, don't let him get away. And that's the way Ahithophel is with David. Let me strike now. He's tired. He's on the run. He's disorganized. Now's the time to strike before he can organize his forces. Everything hinges on killing David. And in verse 4, so the plan pleased Absalom and all the elders of Israel. It pleased Absalom. This is his dad. This is his father. And what I want you to picture here, how the Grinch stole Christmas. Can you see the Grinch and that evil big smile? It pleased Absalom. The death of his own father. And so that's where we'll park our study this morning. Absalom seeks his father's life and this plan to kill him pleases him. Next, we're going to come to the conflicting counsel of Hushai. Absalom's going to call him and find out what he has to say, compare Ahithophel's counsel with that of Hushai, and make a decision. So bring your paper back next week, and we'll continue on beginning in verse 5 and move our way through chapter 17. We're dismissed from class. Thank you.